Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the digital panel. We're going to be discussing the digital economy. And I'm very privileged that they gave me the hardest job to do right after lunch. And everybody is gone. But we're fortunate to have these busy CEOs represent us here. And initially, I believe Eric Siapa has a few things to say to set the stage, the tone of what the digital economy is all about. In the session, we're going to be discussing what are the key drivers to create the reset for us to boost this economy forward and be resilient. Uh, as an economy, Ghana is growing very fast in terms of digital adoption, but there's still some challenges. And the people I have on the panel are actually the doers. So they don't talk too much, but they actually do. They are the execution army uh, that will show us the way and what we need to do to further the storm so that post this pandemic, we'll be more resilient to uh, would withstand any other challenges that we'll have in the economy going forward. So I'll pass the mic on to Mr. Eric Siapa. We'll do a quick introduction, uh, what you do, and then you can go into your speech and share with us the backdrop of everything. Yes, just do a quick introduction, and then we'll take you from there. All right, thank you, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Osiakwan, and I'm managing partner at Chanzo Capital. So Chanzo Capital is an Africa-focused venture capital fund, and we invest in early stage tech and tech-enabled ventures across Africa. We are a Mauritius domicile fund. We have an office here in Accra, Nairobi, and Johannesburg, as well as the US. Our first fund, we invest in a total of 12 companies. Uh, the asset and the management is about $50 million. And we believe that these entrepreneurs are going to be the next big companies um, that will be supporting events like this. So we're excited to be here. Thank you. My name is Patricia Obonai. I'm the CEO for Vodafone Ghana. As many of you would know, we're a technology company and we provide communication through mobile fixed broadband and many of our other markets through TV. Very happy to be here with you this afternoon. Hi, my name is Estelle Akofiosoa. I'm the manager for C-Squared's West Africa operation. C-Squared is an open access infrastructure company that was born out of Google aimed at addressing the infrastructure gap that exists on the continent. Thank you. First of all, I'm really happy to be here with a live panel, a live moderator, and a live audience. So, so it really feels good to not be in front of a screen. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Kanar Kanan. I'm the CEO for Software Group Africa. Uh, Software Group is a global technology company, and in sub-Saharan Africa alone, we have 60 clients over about 20 different markets. Our key offices are in Nairobi and here in Accra. And we have a technology stack um, called DigiWave. And we use DigiWave uh, to build a digital banking platform and a digital insurance platform um, where we provide an omni-channel suite of solutions for financial service providers, both public and private. Uh, we help our clients try to scale, uh, scale securely um, on a platform play uh, and just sort of best in class user experiences uh, throughout. So thank you very much, everybody. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Tevia, uh, CEO of Ostec. Uh, we're a technology company uh, focused on three key areas. Uh, one is infrastructure build. So uh, basically large data centers, uh, large tanky IT uh, infrastructure solutions. The other part of our business uh, is what we call IT managed services. Uh, so we build and then we encourage customers to uh, outsource management to us. The third part of our business uh, is our cyber security business uh, where we deal with uh, what the core of what we do is our uh, SOC, which is the uh, security operations center. Uh, we offer as a service to our customers. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Romeo J. I'm the CEO of IT Consortium. And IT Consortium is um, a fully owned Ghanaian firm. Been around for a while. Uh, we are into financial technology, but we do more of aggregation, um, financial space. We also um, specialize in what we call vertical solutions. Um, so we've done some systems and pensions, insurance, and we try to move the core business from brick and mortar uh, to online. So anything online, we're there. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frank Oye. Um, I work for a company called Margins IG Group. I'm sure most of you have heard about it this morning. Uh, Margins IG Group um, is actually focused on connecting people to services in the most secure manner. So we create trusted identities and trusted documents. On a day-to-day -day basis, I'm responsible for managing a PPP contract with National ID, making sure we execute the contract in the most efficient and economic manner. Also, to make sure that we provide the services for verification platforms that you need to verify the duties in the country. Um, that's what we do at Margins. Thank you. Awesome. So I have every actor possible to be part of this movie for digital economy. And there's, there's a lot happening in the industry uh, globally. And having Eric Chanzo Capital, you've been out there, you've been on so many platforms. You've seen the digital entrepreneurship game playing at scale. Uh, you see Nigeria guys attracting capital. What's happening globally? And how could Uganda attract some of this capability? Give us some background first, and then go into the question. You want me to use slides, or do you, um, we have the slides? So, so what I'm going to try and do is just try to set a tone a little bit um, for the conversation around what I call the Digital Economy Kings of Africa, um, which is a book I wrote in 2016, where I postulated the digital economy in Africa and the countries that are going to lead the digital economy. How many of you remember the digital divide? There was a terminology called the digital divide about three decades ago, which was primarily that the global north has technology and we in the global south were divided, and so we're kind of behind. In the last three decades, it's incredible to see that we are now moved from the digital divide to what I call the digital economy. And I think this morning we've had some pretty amazing conversations and our Vice President, His Excellency, has been a champion of the digital economy in Ghana. Now what has happened in the last three decades is that in the 90s, Africa went straight to mobile. In other words, landlines were challenged, um, and so we went straight to mobile. And what that meant is that we took a different path to digitization. And that part meant that by 2014, ownership of cell phone, adult ownership of cell phone in Africa was at par with the US and the developed world. Now this slide is very important. So within a decade, adult ownership of cell phone was at par with the rest of the world. And then we overtook that, right? And that really coincided with the second phenomenon in the second decade, which is fiber networks. And I happened to be part of a team that developed the open access model that I said talked about. And that model basically meant that small players who are not the big incumbent telcos then can now build fiber infrastructure and be part of the game. And so between 2007 now, we have 18 submarine cables that were built across Africa. Now these submarine cables then connected to the cell phone to create what you call mobile broadband which essentially created what you call a mobile web industry in Africa. So in Africa, the phone is a computer and everybody is connecting through the subsea cables. What that created is what you call a mobile web industry. So mobile started affecting financial services, security, agriculture, health, etc. So this is how the digital economy started emerging in Africa. Now, this is a very important anecdote. So in 2014, Freshfield did a study that look at the performance of 40 TMT, technology media and technology companies across Africa. And over a decade, they made 19% annualized returns. In other words, if you invested in any of the companies I showed you before, you made three times more than oil and gas. So oil and gas was actually overtaken in 2014. So over that decade, there was a significant shift. And therefore, Africa started moving towards the digital economy. Now let's go to the King's country. So then I observed that there were five countries that were leading this new renaissance, which I call the Kings. Uh, and Kings in Africa is really about leaders, right? So these are the countries that are really leading the digital economy, which is Kenya, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. The interesting thing is that these countries, we started seeing innovations in government services, financial services, health, education, agriculture, and these sectors called FinTech started emerging, health tech. Edutech. And these were all sectors that were not there before. And so this new sector became the sector that were driving the digital economy. 
And one important anecdotal evidence is their contribution to GDP growth. So Bloomberg did a study in 2017 and looked at the performance of the contribution of ICT to GDP growth in two of the king's countries, Ghana and Kenya. As you can see, Ghana, Kenya, uh, ICT was contributing 239% to GDP growth. So you begin to see anecdotal evidence that it's not just on returns, but also on economic uh, performance. Now let's look into the future. So what is going to drive this growth further? The first is population growth. As we know, Africa is now a billion people, a little over a billion, and 70% of that is below 25 years. Now, according to the UN, Africa's population is going to quadruple. Now, if 70% of that is below 25 years, it means that Africa is going to produce the workforce of the future. And guess what? That YouTube population have taken to digital. So it means that the next technology companies that you're going to see in the world are going to come from Africa. And that's what we are investing in. So the YouTube population that we have is a great advantage. The second important factor is an emerging middle class. So this slide is also very important because if you look at it, this was a study conducted in 2018 that looked at the emerging middle class in Africa, estimated at 34%. According to the African Development Bank, this is going to go to 60% by 2060. So by 2060, more and more people are going to get out of poverty into the middle class. And guess what? The middle class consumes technology. So these entrepreneurs are going to build technology companies that are going to be consumed by the market. That goes to the last trend, which is the common market in Africa. Today, the common market that was started this year and hosted in Ghana, and which we found as Ghanaians for hosting, of course, our founding president, Kwame Kuma, was a big uh, initiator of Pan-Africanism. So it's great that we host the Secretariat here. The common market is now estimated at $3 trillion. So think about it. You have a one billion population, a little over one billion, with a $3 trillion market. So if that population quadruples, what would the market be like? So it means that the market is going to be in Africa, and that's why all the global technology companies are going to come here, and Africa is going to be the playing ground. So I want to conclude by showing you the potential of the economy. According to Google and IFC, the current digital economy, what they call it internet economy, but it's the same thing, ICT economy, digital economy, pretty much the same thing, is about 115 billion, 15 billion. The estimate that by 2025 be 180 billion, and check by 2050, it will be about, about a trillion dollars. So it actually means that the digital economy is going to be a, the crucial economy for the future and we should be very active in it. So what should we do? My last slide. Obviously, we all know that Ghana needs an economic reset, but I think that we should reset to the digital economy because by focusing on that, we become globally competitive. And it's not only that we need to set up a digital economy act, most importantly, we need to have a digital economy strategy. Because you can have an act, but if you don't have a strategy, you're not going to succeed. Absolutely. Thank you. This is excellent. Uh, let's give uh, Eric a round of applause. This is quite a, a concise summary of what this whole digital economy is all about. But what I want to add to what he said, a lot of you may not know, but digital economy en encompasses multiple things, right? It's not just the fiber, it's not just the mobile. Uh, there are about five major categories. Uh, the first one is the digital infrastructure. So I'm gonna give Jonathan a chance to tell us in the last few years what he's been going through in terms of the digital infrastructure. He mentioned data centers. Why did he get into data centers? What's the growth trajectory in data centers for your business currently? And what can we do to be resilient going forward as a country? This is talking about Ghana as a whole. Right, so this is an area where I think we thrive as a business uh, and an area where we have uh, led, you know, the industry in enabling, uh, you talk about apps and so on, uh, you know, the entrepreneurs that want to go out there and produce the technologies that we need to enable digitalization in this country. So I mentioned earlier um, in my intro that we are, we have a IT infrastructure build part to the business. Well, that's, you know, that's the old, if you like, way of doing things where you know we basically go to a customer, a customer comes to us and say, look, you know, I need a data center. Uh, here, here's a couple million dollars, uh, build it for me, all right? Uh, we're, we're sort of moving away from that to something called infrastructure as a service. And this is what is now enabling all of the new technologies that are coming out uh, to quickly get to market. So, you know, there are a lot of, 
you have a couple guys come out of university, for example. Uh, they have an idea, they can develop an app, but they don't have the money to, you know, go buy servers and you know, storage and all the IT systems uh, to kit out uh, a data center or to kit out, kit out their garage to start developing an app. What we're doing now, and I think that's what um, is enabling, um, you know, this if you like, rush to market that would then lead us to the digitization that we want to achieve is, you know, we're saying to, you know, these young entrepreneurs, we will build the IT infrastructure, all right, and we will offer it to you as a service. So you can sit at home, you know, think about all the different applications you want to develop, the, Whatever it is you want to do, the, you know, the mobile banking apps and, and, and all of that stuff, your Susu app, uh, as we have in this town. But the infrastructure that you need, first of all, to do the development. You know, when you're developing these apps, you need an environment to develop it in. Right here in Ghana, we have built a data center that you can essentially just tap into, use a small element of the resources that we have, do all the development you want to do. When you're ready to go to market, we have another environment in the data center that you can move your app into, publish it to the world, and boom, you know, you're like, up and running, right? Just like that. Just like that. And, and you know, the, the real enabler here is, you know, saying to businesses, or saying to, like I said, saying to startups that you don't need to go and find the money to buy the IT infrastructure because it, it's very expensive. Our data center costs millions of dollars. However, in that data center, you can sit at home and develop your app and from there publish it to the world at a small monthly fee and before you know it, you know, your so business It's very is expensive. It's a critical infrastructure, right? But you've, you've basically enabled more access yes. based on the cost reduction. Essentially, it's a shared tax. Yes. Yeah. Is well, that the same thing as the cloud that is emerging? Well, or is different from the cloud infrastructure? Because what's happening to the startups now is you have an idea. The first word that comes to mind is AWS or Google or Azure. So how different is, uh, uh, is the Ghanaian economy going to compete with the global infrastructure economy out there? And how do we bridge the gap with the local capacity that we talked about? So I think the first thing, is it a cloud service? In its sort of bare knuckle form, yes, it's a cloud service. But what, we, what we're saying to you is, you know, you can go to AWS, and I don't know how many of you know AWS, or you can go to Azure. Azure is Microsoft, AWS is uh, uh, Amazon. And, you know, if you're an up-and-coming, developer and you have a great idea, there's an app you want to develop, it will make a difference to everybody's life in Ghana. Right now, either you go and buy all the IT infrastructure you need, or you go to one of these cloud providers, right? So you might go to Azure or AWS. What we're saying to you is, we built a data center right here in Ghana, and the reason why this matters to our developers in Ghana or the reason why this really should matter to all of us is that the kind of support you need, okay, when you're starting off and you're looking to, you know, use a cloud service and so on, the kind of support you need, you're not going to get from AWS or Azure, right? What you're going to get from a local data center is the engineers are there, they speak your language, you know, you can walk into our office, and engage people who know how to hold your hands, okay, get your app to market quickly. This is what, for me, I think, uh, is enabling. And, and sorry, if I can just add, um, I don't know, was it uh, Andrew was up here earlier on receiving an award? Zipay. I mean, Zipay is a company that, um, you know, will testify to, um, you know, the infrastructure that we have that provide them with a peace of mind to be able to provide uh, some of the services uh, that they do. That's yes. fantastic because uh, you can't do what you're doing without the connectivity capabilities that a Vodafone would deliver or a C-squared would deliver. So how is Vodafone 
ensuring that the ecosystem is going to be resilient. Because the challenge I've heard is we're not in the rural areas. Our service can't extend to this. We don't have fiber here. We have fiber there, but we don't have it on that side. What is Vodafone's strategy and what is, he, what is Vodafone doing to ensure that the Ghanaian digital economy can be re, you know, resilient going forward? Because that's a, a showstopper, right? If you build your house and there's no ECG there, there's a showstopper. If you build your data center, there's no connectivity, that's a showstopper. So what, what is the plan for expansion or capacity building in that, in that regard? Thank you so much. So um, I'm not going to make digital economy sound that sexy. I think it's very basic. You know, the things that Ghana requires to get to this nice technology that we are all using called digital economy. Let me start with human capital, because I think this is important. When we, um, during the lockdown and then post lockdown, we had to let my entire organization work from home. And we've been working from home for a year. It's just this month that we decided to test once a week. This meant that including my call center, everybody went from home. If you don't build your organization to equip your people to become digitally literate to the point of being able to use digital tools, then it doesn't matter all this conversation we're having. If we don't build the people, we will not be able to deliver this digital economy. And so, including my Exco today, everybody is acquiring a digital skill. I can code now. My Exco can code. And it's not because we will become developers, it's because we are opening our minds to the new world and what the world expects of us. We're giving this also to society, and so we've launched this national coding program in a year now. We're doing Code Like a Girl, where many of the youth are joining this program and we're teaching them how to acquire um, one more skill, either it's robotics or it's coding or anything like that. We are building ICT centers for schools because if you do all this and the students come out virtually to become my future employees and not digitally ready, then we can forget about digital economy. It was heartbreaking um, when we launched National Coding that I had over a thousand girls applying in April. However, only 200 could participate because they couldn't get the right connectivity or they couldn't have the right devices. And so they couldn't have. That's why I'm focused on, we can discuss a lot of things, but if we don't see how we build the human capital, then we would, we would have the infrastructure, but we would have people who are not ready to use it. Let me come to infrastructure. The gap in Africa is about $10 billion to be able to close the infrastructure gap. Vodafone spends about $2 billion across the six, seven markets that we have. And so if we are going to meet the 2030 objective um, and close the universal access gap that everybody talks about, then this requires partnership. I know we all talk about the telcos have to build. Yes, the telcos will build. Nobody comes into a country and does not want to do the very basic. If people don't get connected, I don't make money. So it's important for me to do it. There's cost to doing it, and we need to have that partnership. This is a partnership with government. No telco will be able to do national coverage. Today, it's unfortunate in Ghana that we still talk about areas in the country that are only 2G enabled. How are we going to drive digital economy with people with handsets who can only make phone calls? If you want a telco to go into rural, just like we started doing with the infrastructure fund, we pay 1% of our net revenue into um, an infrastructure fund. And this fund is supposed to help build the infrastructure into rural. So now they have started. And since April, some of the sites have started coming up. There are towns in Ghana today that do not have coverage. If you want me to go to that town with 4G, I have to pay $30 million to get Spectrum. That is just one block of that spectrum. How am I going to cover the country with $30 million plus times the three, four bands that I need? This is why I say that this is a shared responsibility. It's a social contract that telcos and governments need to come into and decide that 4G everywhere, for example, is the Ghana agenda if we're going to discuss um, digital economy. And how do we get so that the benefit that comes to government is a long-term benefit, not the, the initial gain that cripples the telco and then is not able to expand. It took time for companies like Vodafone to even go to work. Others had the lead. Some don't even have it to date. 
and we're talking about digital economy. So there are very basic things that you need to fix and expanding infrastructure is definitely one of it. We are on the journey to transform, for example, moving from copper to fiber. The opportunity in Ghana, let me just talk about urban homes, right? Homes that can afford broadband. It's about 800,000. If I combine what everybody has done, it's less than 25% of homes that are connected by cable. We're talking about connectivity in Europe. People have got cable in the home is taken for granted. In Ghana, it's a discussion. This has to be enabled. So last year, the Minister of Finance put it in the budget and said, telcos will work with the electricity company and have access to their poles to drive it. I pray this happens. It is very important that we, we, um, we, we stop clouding this digital the fundamentals have to happen. I like that. I, I, I like when you said the fundamentals have to happen. And, you know, as you were speaking, I was just saying to myself, how do you get a kid or the young business owner in the region to connect to the internet, to do basic work that Romeo and team has put together? It's impossible. There's no connectivity there, right? Uh, we did some insurance work and the agents had to basically test how to procure auto insurance on their mobile devices. There was no data. So basically you resorted to USSD. And if the guy doesn't understand what USSD is, he's confused. So all of a sudden, all the investment you put in is back to nothing. So I think you're right. We shouldn't cloud this whole digital economy, refraff thing we're talking about. Let's go back to basics. The second thing required outside of infrastructure is basically your digital platforms. You have something now, we have to enhance it. But what is gonna cause the community out there to engage? Education was one of the first things, right? After, during the pandemic, schools, kids were sitting on televisions to listen to their classes. The, the, the digital divide has not gone away, by the way, Eric. Uh, it has morphed into more complexity, right? Uh, in America, where they say no child left behind, in Ghana, a lot of kids are getting left behind, right? Because if you don't have a mom and dad who can afford the basic data service, your kid can't do remote education. You are out, right? So, Estelle, this goes back to what your team at C Squared is doing. How, how are we becoming inclusive? Because one of the pillars for the digital economy is, is to be inclusive. One of the things that they look at is how can we be more inclusive in all of this? So bring the kid in the village into the digital economy. Um, thanks, that's not an easy question. Um, and I don't mean it's not an easy, it's easy to answer, but for us to achieve, you know, it really needs a concerted plan. So no longer policies, but actual plans that long-term we're pursuing. And I think Patricia has said it all so well. You know, we can glorify everything with all these big terms, but we need to come down to the basics. So um, at C Squared, we're an open access infrastructure provider. And if we think about infrastructure like roads, we typically share uh, our road, roads. Maybe you pay a toll when you go on the road. Our water pipes come and pass all our homes depending on the area you're in, depending on the area you're in. Electricity also comes in that way. But typically, internet infrastructure has been driven by the telcos coming and making those initial investments. Our governments as well, not so successfully, but making investments in infrastructure. But primarily, it's been the telcos. Um, and so what an open access infrastructure provider like C-Squared does is build a network an infrastructure that's available to all infrastructure, um, all internet service providers. So bringing down the, the cost required, you don't need to invest in it yourself, you can share it. Hopefully it means it, it, it gets expanded quicker nationwide. But as Patricia said, really our the demand side of things um, and the enabling environment, our government talks very well from a policy side. But it's not easy, and I know I commend the telcos that we're so often jumping on them about price and so on. But it's very expensive, not just to deploy, but also to maintain. Um, and we're constantly battling roadworks. 
and nobody cares whether five kilometers of your network just gets ripped up and your customers don't care either. I mean, they just want the service that they're paying for the work. Um, and you can lose a customer today. Someone comes in and takes them. Meanwhile, you know, you'd already invested in them. So we need a concerted effort, yes, from a policy side, but also actual implementation that encourages expansion outside of our key cities. Today, even carrying internet out of Ghana, Accra, and getting to Kumasi is difficult um, and uh, challenged by reality, reality, uh, reliability. We have, Eric talked about how many, we have six plus internet cables that land on the coast today, but I think we have, we use less than 30, 40% of what lands, and the challenge is moving that to our base stations, which our mobile phones connect to, or to uh, business complexes, to residential estates. Um, so we really, to answer your question specifically, we need a plan about what enables and makes it sustainable to invest outside of the key cities, and even in the key cities. And uh, again, to Patricia's point around education, education enables people to make, generate revenue. I know a challenge for a lot of the service providers is you have a customer today and tomorrow internet is a luxury because they've got to pay uh, school fees, electricity, so then they don't use the internet for another two, three, four weeks, you know, or the kids go to back to school so they don't reconnect their service at home. So we need to create sustainable users you know, that are constantly generating re revenue for the investors in infrastructure. Um, so education and then, you know, job creation so that people actually can use the internet and create this digital economy that sounds wonderful. But we, I think we really still are at our brick and mortar stage of even having the infrastructure, having the education, having the jobs. Um, and then the whole thing fits together. And most importantly, having a clear plan that really aligns the government and the private sector. There's so much, there's often in, in our sector, and I'm sure other sectors feel the same, there's still these tensions between government's ambitions and the private sector and finding that, that happy ground, you know, and I was glad to hear the vice president saying, you know, he was inviting the private sector to come Oh, but, you know, it doesn't always feel that open in reality when you're in the private sector. But you know what, just to, to confirm what you're saying, the, the, the public sector doesn't have the capital required. But they're also trying to raise more capital by taxing the private sector from the telco perspective. Uh, because it's like a chicken and egg situation, right? I mean, if you look at the uh, Google and IFC report, I went through that detail. 180 billion by 2025. 2025 will be here next week, right? So it takes two or three years to realize any major infrastructure uh, reform, right? So what is the Ghana Infrastructure Fund doing for the digital economy side? What is the allocation of capital for that? Uh, Chanzo, you, you should be able to help us here. You're the money guy. Well, um the, the bad news is I don't invest in infrastructure. <laughs> you should do that before. <laughs> and I left because it became very deep pockets. But, but, but I, I, I think I share the sentiments of my colleagues. That, um, you know, there is a little bit more that needs, not a little bit more, a lot more that needs to be done from the public policy, uh, you know, providers, you know, i.e. government uh, and the state in creating that environment that is able to extend internet. Because it's, it's quite, um, I mean, staggering that you have, we have about 25 terabits per second just down the road over there. Yes, yes, right there. You know, and that investment has been made mostly by the provider, right? So there needs to be a more, you know, so I, I think we get the message, but I'll let my colleagues also. So, I mean, Jimmy. you are in the market, right? You have digital platforms, Romeo's uh, IT Consortium. Uh, on the telco side, you're delivering your services on their networks. What's going on in terms of the adoption? What are you seeing? Because what I hear is there's no coverage. I hear you have infrastructure from a OSTEC perspective. I'm hearing there's capacity going on in terms of investment. But is there adoption going on? 
because I see mobile money everywhere, <laughs> right? People are using mobile money. Yes. People are playing TikTok on their phone. So in, when you're in the city, as a business leader, you think everybody has the same experience until you go to the Volta region or you go to the north, right? So what are you seeing out there in terms of the evidence? Thank you very much. I, I feel so sad about uh, the infrastructure piece, but um, I also think that um, within where the coverage is, there is progress. Okay, I wish that I will have customers across Ghana. I wish my customer base will be 20 million, not 10 million or 2 million. I mean, currently, the uptake is good. What we've been trying to do is come up with solutions that meet the needs of people. So once you're able to tap into it, you, I mean, the pie is very small, but assuming that it was a full coverage, then that would be good. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an, an example of um, a solution we partnered to build, and which is a pension solution, and it's supposed to fill the gap for informal pension. And this is a solution that is supposed to meet the need of ordinary people. And you take a house help, and a house help is able to create pension for herself or himself. That is good. But how many of them are we able to touch? If you come to a cry, and, 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 and it is sad, you see, most of the time when we sit here and we are talking, we tend to talk about the people here. We, want, we go to Kumasi and we talk. But when you leave Kumasi, in fact, every time I travel to Kumasi, I intentionally track data. And it is not just data, even voice. Also going. So there is a lot to be done with infrastructure, but I, I believe that our society is such that if we can get the infrastructure right, we will double or triple this economy in a very short time. Look at what happened last uh, the, the lockdown. Um, some people think that when the lockdown came, the technology people came. What they don't realize is that for us in payment, if the guy is at home and he doesn't need to go out to the laundry, you don't get payment. And if the payment doesn't come, I, you, you won't get money. Yes, there were other sites that may be picked up. But we have learned that once we come up with solutions that meet needs, people will jump on it. You go to the Kayae, most of them don't carry cash. We tend to think that they carry cash. They don't. You go to the village, people are stopping using cash because, I mean, they will need the agent there to convert, maybe to buy their tomatoes. A friend of mine said he stopped using mobile money. I said, why? It's the first, when the villagers call you and they say, uh, please, can you help me? So the bank has closed. The bank is closed. But now, when you say the bank has closed, then you say, mumumi. <laughs> So they are used to getting money. When you take international money transfer, people are getting the money in the villages. So it is important that we increase the coverage and be able to come up with solutions, and we can. I mean, at our level, we, we are always thinking because we only survive with thinking. And there are solutions that are there that we can bring on board to villages if we have the infrastructure there. I like the idea of the education. Because even as companies as small as ours, we go into education. We try to educate the, the public. We go to, I mean, we're doing something in cocoa. We actually go to the cocoa growing areas where they will, they will tell you that they don't want the money to be given to them in their village. They want the money to be given to them in the next village. And you will never understand why they are saying that. When you give them mobile money, they don't want to cash out in their village. They want to go and cash out in the next village so that nobody, that? So that nobody will know that they have the cash. <laughs> yes, and so you see, you can find a way, once you can get the coverage done, I think that this, this uh, digital economy can really pick up. I mean, I remember 2019, 
there was a digital economy meeting between public and private sector to create a strategy, right? And all the big ways were there. We're in 2021. Do we have a national digital transformation or digital economy strategy? Because I see, I heard from the vice president, ID for all uh, addressing systems there. Do we have a blueprint that we're following, which includes a collaborative effort to bring all parties, because ID touches everybody, right? Just like taxation. So is there a plan, is there a blueprint, is there a calendar, is there a schedule? And we see when the next check will be written so that the IT players here could be happy. They all want to do coverage. It looks like, Patricia, this is like ministry for you all of a sudden. You want to grow the coverage, right? But he, he has ID. We don't know who is who in the villages, right? So have we gotten coverage from an ID perspective all the way to the interlands? Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> let me tell a little story. Ten years ago, when we started this whole National ID project, um, we used to be much younger, full of energy, and um, full of passion. So we did this amazing document. We kind of put ourselves 10, 20 years into the future, imagined what the future would look like, and what that future would look like in a solution we're going to provide for the country. So we went to Minister of Finance after we had approached NIA, told them this fantastic solution, we're going to give you a national ID project, a national ID card, which was digital, EID. Listed all these amazing features. We're going to give you a smart card. This was 10, 15 years ago. We're going to give you a smart card which was contact and contactless, which had 128K chip on it, which had over 12 different security features on it, very hard to forge, which would transform the identity of all Ghanaians. So we got to be sort of finance, we told them all of that. And so, because of the, the richness of the card, we charge. 20 CDs per card. Then the then um, advisor to the president, Billy Ovin, may so rest in peace. Say, hey, you want us to go into a position? <laughs> you can't charge you can't charge for this card, so it should be free. So there we were, having told them all what the cards could do, and Bid said, no. Deliver the cards for free. At the time, so okay, in that case, we might have to scale back some of these things and maybe give you no no no, we want what you've described, but you for, for, for free. So we had to go back to the drawing board and reimagine how to issue smart cards to every Ghanaian adult for free. And do it in a way that will make the project financially viable and also bankable. We did it. But not before I lost all my hair, got grayer, and feel fulfilled. Because this card, which we dreamt about all those years ago, is what is transforming the economy today. So I think what I'm trying to say is that it is not beyond our imagination regardless of the challenge, to produce solutions that are transformational. After all, what is digitization? What is it? It's just converting data into zeros and ones, bytes, which then allows people to... So are you, do you have the coverage to the rural areas today? So we did all of that. And um, of course, when we were designing our solution, we are aware of the remoteness and lack of connectivity across the whole country. So that was one of the reasons why we also made provisions to compensate for that connectivity. The national ID card, as it is now, can be verified 
anywhere in the country, regardless of where you are, whether you have connectivity or not, because we've designed in both online verification and offline verification. So you can take your card to any verification device. It will read your fingerprint, match it with what's on the card, because we have what's on the card called a match on card. And then very, oh, this fingerprint matches with the very print on the card. So go ahead and do your business. So These are some of the things that we look at. Yes, we are facing a lot of challenges, and we've raised it, we've done a lot of self-engagement with stakeholders, with telcos, I met a lot of them. But we should also look at the opportunity that digitalization gives us as firms and as, 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 a, as a nation. Because what's gonna happen is, once businesses begin to use the national ID card, the EID to, to create business and generate revenue, that revenue could go back into investments. I think it's a, 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 a not a virtual cycle, but a, a, virtual, a, a virtual cycle where we can all use and leverage our national ID card to actually build our businesses. What I held us back in the past was a lack of EIDs and also the administrative limitations on the firm. Firms could not sit in Accra and remotely control their branches across the country because of connectivity. What this would do is that it allows customers to become almost super, superhuman. A verified national ID card allows you to become, you can be here doing a banking transaction, you can be here buying things online, you can be here also if you may be finding love online. It can be anywhere. So if we have this opportunity, that will allow companies to scale up by just by virtue of putting an idea to this opportunity or this platform and to scale you up, we can make a lot of money to actually, um, what they call it, grow, 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 grow the capabilities of fame. So I think that this is what we've done. I, li I like what you said about superhumans. <laughs> I, I like that a lot. But guess what? Know your customer is a very, very key fundamental thing in, in almost all the digital transactions that we do. Uh, Connor, you are involved in supporting banks with digital tools in order for them to engage with their customers. What are some of the challenges? I mean, Kenya has you know, transformed the, that economy. You've seen Kenya's growth. What are you seeing in Ghana, in the Ghanaian market? with your software tools that you're selling. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's always hard to say something smart after six other people say really smart things. Um, but uh, look, I'm gonna throw another, I'm gonna throw another um, term into the mix here. You said digital divide, you said digital economy. I, I, I look at it as a digital continuum. Um, on one side of this continuum, you have the completely unbanked individual with a feature phone, and the question is, how do I onboard them to this continuum? Because it is, you start there, and you sort of transformation denotes process, which moves you along a continuum. In the middle of the continuum, you have you know, a, a mobile money account holder with a feature phone, but that's all they have. So the question for them is, how do you, how do you give them you know, products and services that help them mature in their business life or their personal life to help them sort of graduate further along that continuum and then on the on the on the far side of the continuum you have the you have the fully fledged smartphone user right which is effectively all of us in this room and and what we want is experience products and services are not really as relevant as new experiences there and effectively this is sort of the process that i think you know, everybody sort of fits into this from one stage of the digital continuum to the other. And, and graduating from one place to another is, is really hard. And it starts with ecosystems. How do you do this? It's about ecosystems and understanding those ecosystems. So ecosystems were mentioned with, by His Excellency, uh, the Vice President earlier today. Um, he mentioned things like the, the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, 
He mentioned things like interoperability. These are absolutely the things that, that start this process and create an ecosystem. Now, what, what I see is, is there's great progress here, but what COVID-19 told us uh, in this market in particular is that we have to be faster and we have to be smarter. Um, and the, you know, from the ecosystem perspective, it's how do we use technology platforms to pull the ecosystem of services, all kinds of services, value-adding services, around the technology platform so that you can then put it directly around the customer. Okay, so let me give you some examples. Uh, with regards to the fully-fledged smartphone user, right? we have a client who took a, our mobile wallet solution and they didn't just do sort of, you know, top up airtime and bill payments. And those are all really, really great things. But what they did was they did 300 unique integrations. And they loaded that wallet with all of the government services, insurance, e-commerce, all kinds of value adding services that effectively took the ecosystem and put it right around the client. It's all there for you. For, let's go further down the continuum where we have you know, feature phone users, or how do, you know, and, let, and let's use a, a public uh, financial service provider. So we have the government who wants to give, you know, services to their constituents in the form of pensions or social welfare or, um, or even, you know, make it easy to, to pay certain payments of tax or, you know, even if you get pulled over by the police, you know, to pay, to pay your tickets easily. Uh, you know, so what we did was we, we worked with a postal agency to transform postal offices into a hub where digital services could be delivered to. And from those hubs, there were even mobile officers who could then take offline devices into the field and then come back to the post office and synchronize that, right? And then all of a sudden, you've taken the ecosystem, like you said, that exists in the cities that we all see, but you've transported it, right, outwards. Um, and I think, that, I think that if I had to boil it down, how, what, what do I see in this market that's going to take us to the next level, in my opinion? I think all of us that own a technology platform have to embrace the idea that the products and services on that platform don't necessarily need to be only our own. And I think that once that happens, we can really push that change. And I think in the past, it's all about, okay, I have my platform and I'm gonna use my platform to push my products. I think that, I think that once we open to the concept of, of greater products and services that aren't necessarily our own on the platforms, the ecosystems will really, really thrive. They'll really thrive. I think that that can be a really powerful thing. And, and I believe that tech platforms are the things that enable that, enable that ecosystem play. Um, awesome, awesome. Thank you for the continuum. I like that last bit. Uh, it's no longer a divide. Uh, <laughs> Eric said we've moved to an economy. And he said it's not an economy just yet because we're too basic. And we have to solve the fundamentals. And you said that we become superhumans if we know who we are, and identity can become quite useful. It's, it's self-relevant, right? And then you are saying you wish what's happening in the city actually gets transformed. We should do the city and do it well, and then push it to the rest of the villages. But you are saying business can start now. We don't have to wait, and there's opportunity for us to grow. But guess what? We have the public. They think otherwise. They have some questions. Any questions in the audience for us? And there, please come to the mic. Hello, everyone. Um, Otibo Ating Kubran, and I'm very passionate about uh, getting Ghanaian young professionals and Ghanaian educated talent involved in the tech space. You look at tech, and um, from finance to healthcare all the way down to infrastructure and supply chain, right? There's immense opportunity for us to tap in. And from Eric's analysis that he did, it's obvious, like, you see Google looking at Ghana, you see 
Twitter looking at Ghana, you see Microsoft eagerly excited about Kenya and Nigeria, right? And one thing that I'm, I'd want to find out from you all is how would we be able to tap into the talent that we have, right? Because it's a given, like, Ghana turns out high caliber students, right? From all facets of like uh, education. And it doesn't take one being skilled or versed in computer science or computer engineering to become active in the tech space. So in essence, what I'm saying is, how do we create space for Ghana and Africa by becoming maybe like a tech center of excellence for the region or, for, or maybe for Africa for that matter? Thank you very much. And I, I like that question. I think Patricia, you're already doing some work in terms of hubs in the schools, you said. Uh, personally, I also have access to some of the hubs. Uh, there's a lot of digital entrepreneurship going on already. Uh, what they are lacking is capacity in terms of uh, the access to the market, right? Because these talents, if you don't have customers to solve your problems, it's just gonna be shiny tool on your table, right? So access to market is very key, but I think you said something that you're building. Uh, how are we gonna enable Ghana to become the center? Mr. Moderator, respectfully, you have 10 minutes to go. Would you like to collate all the questions? Collate the questions, that would be good. Split it. Right. My name is uh, Mark, Mark Mago from Software Group. The question, I think, will be directed to the CEO of uh, Vodafone. In recent time, the government was saying that it's encouraging all the clubs to actually do internal room. So the question I'm asking is, with the gap in infrastructure, how will the internal roaming be successful? Yeah, we're going to collate all the questions and then. So the question again is, how are we going to handle roaming? Yeah. I'm asking, if, if we have a gap in infrastructure, how will the internal roaming be successful? Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, can you hear me? All right. So my name is uh, Brian Vitale. I'm with uh, Aguilar Capital. We're a Canadian investment bank that's uh, active here on the African continent. Um, so the question I have, um, I'll lead it with an example. Um, you see, you all remember when Barack Obama was being elected president and uh, the embrace of social media and so on, how it's viewed as a positive thing. Uh, fast forward to when uh, Donald Trump became president and how it was viewed as a negative thing in some respects uh, as far as you know false information that sort of thing is concerned it culminated with him being banned from you know uh, certain social media platforms so the question I'm asking is um, you know we talk a lot about all the positive things that you know the digitization of our economy is going to do and so on what are some of the shall we say unintended consequences that are beginning to be evident from your perspective as far as this transformation is concerned that's, that's my question. What are the consequences of going digital? Unintended consequences. We know what we want from it, but what are the sort of the things that are not, um, you know, just negative outcomes, shall we say, from what what we're seeing from your perspective as a You know, the issue on the roaming is to accelerate some of the basic conversation that we are having here today. It will not expand the limits because we are where we are so others can be where I am and I can be where they are so a customer should not suffer because of the network he's chosen to associate with by the products that the customer that the network has. Telcos will not compete on infrastructure they will compete on services and that's what I believe government is trying to, to even now so the customer doesn't suffer today for example you go to a mobile money agent and he actually asks you which network you are on decides whether to serve you or not. This is ridiculous. And these are some of the things that need to change when we talk about infrastructure sharing and network sharing. The discussion should be in the background. The customer should be able to travel across the country and have service and be able to carry on his business and do all the things we are talking about. 
without being limited by which method they decide to associate with. So that's the conversation. It does not address the rural connectivity. It does not address a town where all four telcos are not present. For that, we will have to agree that this is a, a social contract, as I keep saying, between us and government, and the cost of getting there will have to be reduced. There's a cost to get into any town. We can, we can come together to do it. Today, we even use tower companies so the telco doesn't have to put the mask, but to buy the equipment and bring it in country, there's a, there's a huge income tax on, 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 on import, import tax that you have to pay. There's huge cost of spectrum that you have to pay. So you decide, it's simple, that town will get only 2G, I'm not going to get 4 because I have to pay for it. So there's a barrier that has to be taken off to answer your question to help us to actually expand the industry. So basically the telcos want a discount, okay? Then we'll solve all your problems. Okay. Uh, That's not what she said. Well, in so many ways. <laughs> um, so on the tech hubs and the and, uh, enabling young people and what is happening, um, where my brain went when I was listening to that is, I'm sure if Patricia and I were running the Ministry of Communications and Digitization. Um, and just listening to you, and you were talking about the post offices and how you could have services that enable people that are offline. How long have we been talking about transforming our post offices? How long have we been talking about our community information centers? And there's hundreds of them uh, that different governments have rolled out. And I think really, apart from a few that are sort of pilots, specially adopted by some private sector operator, or has a particularly forward-looking district assembly person, uh, most of them are buildings with nothing happening. In them. And I, so I think that's where, uh, and because if you're in Accra, there's a lot happening on the tech hub scene, and, and impact hub, iSpace, um, who am I not thinking about? Mess, Gun Innovation Hub, etc., etc. Et the Stanvik uh, Hub, um, you know, and it, it goes on and on, right? It, when you're in Accra, there's a couple in Kumasi as well. But outside of that, and that's where the community information centers, government, partner with the private sector operator, make it work their while, whether it's uh, tax breaks or um, you know, you get the building for free, no electricity, et cetera, et cetera, in your first five, 10 years. That's the kind of partnership, and, and, and the private sector will find a way to make it work. The other one for me is our national service. I think our national service, if run properly, is such a huge opportunity to give young people what they need that our education system doesn't necessarily give them. So that could be training in coding, etc. But it can also be all the soft skills that actually all of us really look for when we're employing people. Do they think out of the box? Can they communicate? You know, um, is integrity part of their living? Um, and I think our national service is a, is a great opportunity to also give uh, businesses, startups, free staffing. Right? But it's a win-win. So whilst they're there, the young people are getting the experience they need, the exposure, they're getting something on their CV. So to me, these are two huge opportunities that I just think we could do so much better in Ghana, and I think it could really help um, in addressing an area. You know, that's the, the, we need to look 360, but I do think that's two areas that to me could make a big difference. I think the financial services sector Serving the rural markets, they have the effects we want them In Telco, I think they have the effect. Yeah, and I think the gap right now from all the deliberations, we haven't had a concerted effort to sit together and look at the best models, the economic models that makes it wise for a service provider like C Square, or ITC, or Margins, or Austin, to go to the villages. If the model is not defined, we're not going to do it. Right. So, ITC, ceramic, third question. Um, let me see if I, I got the question right. Is it the unintended? Uh, bad things. That bad things. Like, okay. 
Oh. That one. Have a EID. All of a sudden, you're a bad boy. Don't... No, I mean, if you're a bad boy, it doesn't matter where they place you. You know, they, they, the Ashantis have um, a proverb that if, if you're a bad boy, it's like uh, a cassava stick. Wherever you place it, it will grow. So what, so what I think you meant is the, 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 the thing is that yeah, the, issue. Yes, yes. I think that one, training, and two, giving people something to work towards. I remember um, we used to argue about giving your children access to internet, and we still worry about it, right? When your child gets your phone, you, you, you do things that you, you've never done. So training people with values is what we have to do, because whatever we do, the thing will come. We are all talking about assets. You will never leave the children out and expect that when they grow, they'll be able to do the thing that you expect them to do. So one, giving them values, even within that is important. So the training for me is what we need to do and giving children or young people something to spend their energy on. Let me give you an example. Um, you have maybe a seven, eight year old child at home and he likes to play with a computer and you get him or her a coding lesson, scripts, and he starts developing something, you'll be surprised if the, the person has that interest, he or she will not spend time doing bad things. All his or her energy will be in that. Sometimes people think that when you open the space, then everybody will be speaking. And the, but when people have vented their, their frustrations, they start thinking. So I believe that, yes, there will be vices. But once we keep children focused on the good thing, we will get a number of them bringing innovation. If my child comes home and his friend has been able to create an app that is making money, do you think that he will spend time misbehaving? No, because he will look at his friend and say, ah, I can do this. Absolutely. Yes, so well, the bad thing will happen, but don't worry. Yes. Sorry, I know we're short on time. Can I add to this unintended before, consequences? Before, before you go on the unintended, okay. we have just a minute for each person to say some last words and then our time is up uh, and then we can continue offline. Okay, sorry, I'll be super fast. So nobody mentioned uh, uh, advanced analytics, machine learning, or artificial intelligence in this discussion. And I think if an intended, I, this maybe isn't a consequence now, but it could be if we don't think really carefully about it. I think everybody looks at artificial intelligence as a way to sort of reduce human interaction and customize, and that may all be, sh you know, certain for certain people further down this continuum that I mentioned. But I think if we if we only focus on that, we're going to miss the fact that human interaction is actually required. I think at many other parts of this digital continuum. And if we forget that, then we're not going to address, I think, the sophisticated and complex needs of people, you know, at that level as well. And so I think we have to be very careful about, about this discussion, um, because I think it's being taken at some point, but it, it's relevant across the whole, the whole spectrum, and I, I think it's just really important to mention. Absolutely, AI yeah, for good, right? Two seconds. I think, um, I think we're getting to a stage where we're too preoccupied with the big, flashy terms of organization. And I like what Patricia said about going down to basics. Um, we're talking about fourth industrial revolution. We're not even out of third yet in Ghana. So let's make sure that we also temper expectations, AI and things actually require solid basis in statistics before you go into the data, all those things need to be built down in terms of literacy, training, all that, before you actually begin to leverage all these big terms, blockchain, AI, and all these big data. So let's look at where we are now and then deliver solutions that will actually meet our current situation with a view of um, building an um, uh, economy going for taking um, into account all these um, potential opportunities we have. Wait, we're still at Digital Economy version 1, right? <laughs> all right, Romeo. 
you. Um, Two yes, seconds. Yes, I, I, I think that one of the things that I would want to challenge all of us business people here is um, invest in research because we cannot continue to be consumers of technology when we are not producing. It is not lasting. So as business people, let us put some money aside for research and invest in young people. Thank you. Awesome. I think we have an opportunity to leapfrog some of the phases that the developed countries went through to get to where they are. We're fortunate enough to have access to some of the technologies that we have now that they didn't. Uh, we're not being mainframe computers that they did and so on. Uh, so we shouldn't shy away from, I know Accra is you know, way more developed than other regions, but perhaps this is what we need to spring into other regions, right? You know, you've got to take one step first. So let's not shy away from investing and developing in Accra, the technologies, it will get to the other regions. Yes, we need government to do its part uh, in some of this infrastructure work, but let's do what we can do, don't hold back. Let's do, do it now. If you can do it in Accra, just do it. And you know, the growth will come or the development will come and it will reach the other regions. That's how mobile money came about, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You said your last words, but I give you one more thing. Thank you so much. Um, let's em let, let me repeat, let's embrace uh, the concept that not all products and services on our technology platforms have to be our own. And I think that will drive a culture of innovation. I think that will drive you know, a system change. It will enable stakeholders throughout our value-added services in the economy. Um, and, and I think it'll be really transformative. I think that would be my message. So as I've been sitting here, it has dawned on me that I sat here two years ago and talked about the CICs and national service. Um, and so what I'm leaving here with, not necessarily what I came here thinking I was going to be wrapping up with, but just, it's so important that we do have a national plan and that it's broken down, no big terms, you know, um, and we commit to it, both public and private. It doesn't matter who the government is, it's Ghana's national ICT or digitization plan, and we stick to it. Because otherwise, well, I might be here again in a year's time, still talking about us actually using those CIC. So Thanks for the point. warning. <laughs> I think I've said enough to government, so let me speak to corporates and SMEs gathered here. I think that whilst we talk about partnering with government, that's a lot that we can do ourselves. And it's, it was shocking to see how many businesses were not even present online when COVID happened, and many who couldn't work on their own. And we have to partner with many companies, especially our SMEs, to get them to have effective brands online, a very good presence, and be able to drive payments. It is not a joke when we said we were waiving off um, the cost of transactions so that it would be free for people. It was not because we just wanted to give away our profit, but it was our contribution to driving the digital economy. I think there are very practical things that we can do as individual organizations to help to drive the agenda whilst we wait for government to also do the big So together we can. Thank you. I like that. Um, so, I mean, look, the reality is that the, the future is going to be digital. But whether we, we have our issues or not, it's going to happen. And I believe that human progress is based on people having a mission and dreaming and then putting action to, to achieve it. So I am inspired by entrepreneurs who, within all these challenges we talked about, still wake up every day and they dream that they can build the next Facebook, they can build the next Google, they can build the next. Uh, Airbnb from Ghana. Actually, interesting story. Last week, the German partner from Kumasi, who wants to build a, uh, a void platform that doesn't need a internet. For me, that's what inspires me. Because these are going to be the business of the future. Remember, MTN today or Vodafone today was sometime a business or somebody's idea. So somebody imagined it, and today it's there. 
So let's go out, let's believe in the guys who imagine and they want to build a future and let's find a way of supporting them. And that's why we invest in it. Thank you. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much. Audience, thanks for your patience. I have learned a lot uh, and I hope you've also learned a lot. Uh, keep this space alive. Digital economy champions and kings. Queens and kings and queens. So maybe that should be the sequel. We should have the queens component as well. But we're very grateful for your time and thanks to the CEO network for having us share our thoughts. Thank you. Frank Oye, Estelle Akufiosoa, Patricia Obunai, Jonathan Teria, Romeo Buje, Eric Osiapan, Kono Hanan, and the moderator Samuel Amani. Thank you ever so much for lending us your insights.